said that it is right and proper we look again at raising the state pension age. We will do what we always do, act in the best interests of the people of Scotland. Yeah. Yeah. We now move to First Minister's questions. Question number one, Joanne Lamont. Thank you, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister what engagements he has planned for the rest of the day. First Minister. Uh, engagements to take forward the, the Government's programme for Scotland. Joanne Lamont. Thank you. In 2012, the then Health Secretary, Nicola Sturgeon, proposed changes to mental health services in Lanarkshire. They were opposed by her Cabinet colleague and local MSP, Alec Neil. She addressed his concerns and the professional medical advice was that the changes should go ahead. When Alec Neil became Health Secretary in September 2012, he ordered that the changes be reversed against medical and patient opinion. He then deceived this Parliament and deceived the people of Scotland by saying, by saying, Order, by saying he would take no part in the decision he had already made. If Alec Neil won't resign for deceiving Parliament, will the First Minister sack him? Ms. Lo First Minister, First Minister, First Minister. We will not have members accusing each other of deceiving across the chamber, First Minister. Uh, the answer is no. Lamont. Well, perhaps the First Minister should look at the documents as, that my colleague John Pentland obtained through Freedom of Information. Because we now know that on the 26th of September 2012, Alec Neil's office emailed this instruction to officials. And I quote, Mr. Neil is clear in his view that acute mental health facilities should be retained in both Wishaw and Monklands. The Cabinet Secretary has asked that you seek agreement from NHS Lanarkshire to reconfigure their plans accordingly. With that order, he reversed Nicola Sturgeon's policy made on the advice of medical professionals and backed by patients. He then told this chamber, the head of the NHS and the head of the civil service, that he would absent himself from a decision on these services, <laughs> even although Alec Neil had already made the decision. So if Alec won't resign because of this behaviour, will the First Minister sack him? First Minister. I, uh... That's the same question as she asked, uh, uh, and uh, I, 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 I gave her the, the answer in answer to the, the first question. And just because you say uh, deceiving instead of misleading, it doesn't remove the responsibility to try and give some substance to the charges she's making. <laughs> I looked at uh, this issue on the 14th of uh, uh, February uh, 2013. I gave a substantial reply to Ms McMahon, the MSP who raised it with me. Uh, in terms of her, her, uh, her request as to whether Alec Neil was in breach of the ministerial code, uh, I pointed out, and I will read it to, uh, to Joanne Lamont, uh, in the light of questions in the Scottish Parliament on the 26th of September, that is the date I think she mentioned, but she forgot to say about the questions in the Parliament, about these proposed changes in the narrowing parliamentary focus on the impact of proposals for Monklands Hospital, Mr Neil became concerned there could be a perception of a conflict of interest. Accordingly, Order. he agreed that day with the Director General of Health and Social Care, Derek Feely, that all matters relating to mental health services at Monklands Hospital should be dealt with by the Minister for Public Health. Mr Feely informed the Permanent Secretary on the 27th of September. That is exactly how ministers should behave under these circumstances. Order. Order. I can say to the, uh, to the Labour Party there is another aspect to this that they should bear uh, in mind. Uh, the question of mental health services in Lanarkshire infects a whole area of a health board. It has a constituency aspect, as it has an aspect to all constituencies in that health board area. But to define it purely as a constituency issue uh, ignores the fact that the health service uh, affects and serves all of the population. Uh, I looked at the issue carefully last year. Uh, I came to the conclusion Mr Neil had acted perfectly properly. I replied, <laughs> I replied in these terms uh, to the member concerned, uh, and if Joanne Lamont likes to look at that reply and acknowledge the sequence of events, uh, she will see, see that that reply is validated by the evidence.
Joanne Lamming. I think the First Minister needs to look at the sequence of events because it's all about the timing. So let me help him. At 9.43am on the 26th of September, Alec Neil's office issued the order to reverse Nicola Sturgeon's decision. At 2pm, which is after 9.43am, Alec Neil told this chamber that NHS Lanarkshire was reviewing its decision, but he had already ordered the board to change its position. On 19 December 2012, when asked about that decision, he told, the Parliament, he told this Parliament, and I quote, I decided early on in my tenure to give responsibility for that matter to my deputy, Michael Matheson, as I did not want any perception of any potential conflict of interest between my role as the MSP for Adrian Schatz, where Monklands Hospital resides, and my role as Cabinet Secretary. But the fact is, there was no perception of potential. There was the reality of the decision Alec Neil had already taken and then tried to cover up. So I ask the First Minister again, if Alec Neil won't resign, will the First Minister sack him? First Minister. Asking the first question for the first time, it led to the same answer. No, I won't, because I reviewed the evidence and came to the conclusion that Mr Neil acted perfectly properly. All that Joanne Lamont has done in citing is exactly what I said to her colleague all these months ago. I detailed the sequence of events at that time. That's the sequence of events that have been validated on the 26th of September. This great revelation that Joanne Lamont brings to the Chamber is merely a confirmation of the sequence of events which was detailed to our colleague last, last year. Uh, of course, that is the events. It was after the question time, as said in the letter on the 26th of September, that Mr Neil asked for advice and took the requisite action. Uh, can I say in terms of the Order. ministerial code? Uh, the Ministerial Code makes it quite clear how ministers should act. It also makes it quite clear of the First Minister's role uh, in judging that. Uh, unlike the Labour Party, we are the only administration who put in an independent oversight of the Ministerial Code. Uh, on six occasions, people like Joanne Lamont have come to this chamber and said there was an enormous scandal. And because it affected me and because I was under question, I have referred it to independent oversight. On six occasions, six occasions, I've been cleared by that independent commission. And you know what? Hardly ever after clearing have the people who were making allegations in this chamber of dreadful doings been prepared to acknowledge the independent oversight. So when I've looked at Mr Neil's conduct and given an explanation to her colleague, said exactly what happened, then I think in reasonableness, unless she's got some dramatic revelation to bring, which she hasn't, she should accept that Mr Neil acted not just in the benefits of his own constituents, but in discharged his responsibilities as health Secretary. That's why he took the action he did, and that's why the answer to Joanne Lamont's question is no for the third time. Joanne Lamont. That was just noise. It did not answer the question. Alec Neil made a decision and then extracted himself and said if there were further decisions, somebody else would make that decision. He had already made it in the morning. Yeah. Now, we've established that Alec Neil has not been clear about what he did in relation to services in NHS Lanarkshire, but we do wonder how far up the government this process went. Peter Housden wrote to Siobhan McMahon, I would reiterate that should a ministerial decision be required, this will be taken by the Minister for Public Health. Clearing Alec Neil, the First Minister, as we've heard, wrote to Siobhan McMahon saying the same thing. But there was no need for a ministerial decision to be made by Michael Matheson because Alec Neil had already made his ministerial decision. So, were Peter Housden and the First Minister in on this, or did Alec Neil play them? Or did Alec Neil play them? Or did Alec Order. Neil or did Alec Neil play them for fools? I ask again, if Alec Neil won't resign for this behaviour, will the First Minister sack him? First Minister. 
Uh, well, I, I suppose, in the sense I'm First Minister of Scotland, I'm in on everything that happens <laughs> in, this, in this government. But all that Joanne Lamont's doing, by asking something for the first okay. time, is making herself and her party look ridiculous. <laughs> I have to say, Alec Neil has a, a long record of uh, looking and campaigning for the health service in Lanarkshire. If Alec Neil hadn't campaigned as a candidate, there wouldn't be an accident and emergency in Monglands. <laughs> and it's quite clear that the Labour okay. Party's interest in hey, mental health in, uh, in Lanarkshire isn't anything to do with facilities for the patients. It's just an argument to try and get at an SNP minister. Yeah. So having had the detailed events, the detailed explanation from the Permanent Secretary and the First Minister all that time ago, will Joanne Lamont not accept that the answer to her question is no? And perhaps the next time she comes to this chamber, she'll start talking about the substantive issues yeah. that affect the people of Scotland. Question number two, Ruth Davidson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the First Minister when he will next meet the Secretary of State for Scotland. First Minister. Uh, no plans near future, as far as I know. Ruth Davidson. Presiding Officer, I'm sure the whole Chamber is delighted to hear that Mo Farah is competing in the Commonwealth Games in Glasgow. We want the world's elite to compete in Scotland. Glasgow's organising committee has worked hard to ensure that venues such as the Hydro, the Velodrome and the Emirates Arena were completed on time and on budget, and they should be given all due credit. But their hard work has been undermined this week by the shambolic ticketing fiasco, which has seen tens of thousands of families spend hours on hold and still no prospect of tickets. So does the First Minister agree that it is outrageous that a hired and company, paid handsomely for its work, is now damaging the reputation of our games? And what does he plan to do about it? Minister. Well, uh, can, I, can I say firstly that like the organisation, uh, organising committee ha has apologised for the delay and the frustration uh, that people had when they were trying to get uh, the last of these tickets which were made uh, uh, available for, for sale. And they were right to do so. I can also say that along with our, our partners uh, in Glasgow Council, uh, the Minister for uh, Sport is meeting with the the organising committee this afternoon, and out of that, we hope, will come a resolution of this situation in terms of practical action. So, with the recognising the organisation committee's apology and recognising the frustration uh, that many people would feel, uh, can we just try and get matters into some sort of context? We are dealing with a games which, almost uniquely, uh, among the games of the last uh, generation, is on time uh, and on budget where every facility is complete, uh, where the transformation of the, the city of Glasgow and the east end of Glasgow is absolutely amazing, where over a million tickets have already been sold. And in terms of this last 100,000 or so, these are tickets which the organising committee tried to get back from, from sponsors and from uh, in the international federations in order to try and give the public more chance of getting to the Games. So, of course, the organising committee will enable to sort out the situation which has caused frustration for people. But I think even the people who have been frustrated will recognise that there is an overwhelming demand for tickets, that the organising committee are doing absolutely everything they can to make sure that every venue is full in these Commonwealth Games. And they will sort out the problems and people will get that other opportunity to buy tickets. But can we please put this in the context that Glasgow and Scotland are going to enjoy and experience uh, the most superb sporting and cultural event that Scotland has ever seen? Well, I have acknowledged the great work that Dave Grevenberg and his team has done, great work in preparing for these games, both in physical infrastructure and in the way in which we've projected both my city of Glasgow and Scotland to the world. And I welcome the fact the First Minister says uh, Shona Robinson is going to meet with officials at the organising committee. Uh, I trust that as a newly promoted cabinet level minister, she'll bring this problem to a speedy conclusion because it's not about patching it up and hoping for the best. We need to find out what went wrong, fix it, and reassure families who are still waiting on tickets that the system is back on track. 
So can the First Minister assure us today that his Cabinet Minister will have this fixed by the weekend so the ticket site can open on Monday morning? So that the ticketing site will open on Monday morning and if not, will she take responsibility? First Minister. My goodness. Uh, well, can we just thank Ruth Davidson for her entirely supportive and collegiate <laughs> remarks in terms of the Commonwealth Games. The, the Cabinet Secretary and our partners in Glasgow Council for, for the last seven years have worked together uh, to try and bring about these games on a cross-party basis. There have been many, many decisions that have had to be made uh, in order to arrive at the excellent position uh, that we are now in. It, she asks, why did this situation uh, arise? This situ situation arose because there was an overwhelming demand for the last 10% of tickets because this is a Games which is going to be a sellout in every event. Now, yes, of course, the organising committee have apologised for the breakdown in Ticketmaster systems. That is a matter of great regret and frustration. And yes, of course, uh, the Minister and indeed our partners in Glasgow Council are with the organisation committee to sort out the issue. But can I say to Ruth Davidson, uh, given all of the success that that organising committee have had in delivering the venues, in delivering the games, in taking the big decisions and recognising we're in this situation because of their attempts to try and get more tickets to satisfy the overwhelming demand, can she and her party yes. not find it in their hearts right now yeah. to try and get behind the organising yeah. committee to help them yeah. sort no, out yeah. the difficulty yeah. as He's opposed to making the most party political petty points about it? Yeah. <laughs> this is the question. Alice McInnes. Presiding officer, the First Minister will be aware of the very serious disturbance at HMP Grampian, which involves 39 inmates in a 14-hour siege overnight Tuesday into yesterday morning. While no one was injured, I understand that significant damage has been caused to Ellen Wing of the new prison. What steps will his government take to ensure good order is maintained in the future? First Minister. Well, uh, substantial steps uh, have already been taken. Uh, I should say to the, the Chamber, as the member correctly says, the, the issue was brought uh, to a conclusion. Certain decisions have been made by the Scottish Prison Service in terms of relocating prisoners. Uh, of course, it is not unknown for, for new prisons to have this sort of, of incident. It has happened a number of times in the past. That does not make it acceptable. It does not make it permissible that action has been taken. Uh, but uh, the member can be uh, reassured that the appropriate action has been taken to make sure our newest prison in Scotland shall perform efficiently and properly. Uh, it, we should also deprecate uh, this sort of uh, behaviour in the prison service. So as well as the action that's been taken by the prison service to sort things out, let's make no illusions about who is responsible for unacceptable behaviour. That is the perpetrators of the behaviour. John Scott. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister will be aware that GE Caledonian announced 170 redundancies last week at their plant at Prestwick which will reduce their staff number to around 450. While specialist servicing of the CF6 engines is obviously a highly skilled job in a very competitive marketplace, what help can the Scottish Government, through Scottish Enterprise and other agencies, give to this high-quality company and its employees at this difficult time? First Minister. Well, as the, the Member will know, that uh, the GE Caledonian have already been under offer and indeed received the RSA grant to try and safeguard the jobs. You'll also know that we're dealing with a situation of a new facility opening in Taiwan, which is extremely competitive in terms of some of the functions and work that's been continued at Press Week. The Cabinet Secretary met the company yesterday to discuss exactly these matters. The local PACE chair and team are available to provide support for the affected employees, and he can be absolutely assured that we will do everything in our power to maintain and to hopefully in the future increase the maximum employment in the Presswick facility. Question three, Patrick Harvey. To ask the First Minister what steps Revenue Scotland would take to prevent tax avoidance practices in the event that Scotland had greater responsibility for taxation. First Minister. Well, the Scottish Government intends to take the toughest possible line on aggressive tax avoidance. It would determine to act decisively on avoidance, for example, now of devolved taxation. The Revenue Scotland Tax Power Bill, which is currently before Parliament, 
contains powers which will enable Revenue Scotland to take that robust action to counteract tax avoidance, including the introduction, as Patrick Harvey will know, of a wide-ranging general anti-avoidance rule for devolved taxes. The Scottish Government will seek to replicate this approach in developing the Scottish tax system following independence. Patrick Harvey. Recent days have seen further revelations about the scale of the scandal of tax avoidance in the UK, from the members of Take That and other wealthy individuals in the icebreaker scam to Amazon's corporate tax bill of £4.2 million after sales of £4.3 billion, while HMRC seem most concerned with selling citizens' tax data to the highest bidder. Will the First Minister join with the many calls that are growing for a boycott of Amazon until it starts paying its fair share? And does he agree that only Europe-wide cooperation between countries on corporate tax levels can stop the loopholes that disreputable companies like Amazon are so determined to wriggle through? First Minister. I, I won't uh, join a call for a boycott. That would have a, an impact on Scottish workers and Scottish jobs, as Patrick Harvey should know. However, what I would say is I deprecate aggressive tax avoidance. Tax evasion, of course, is illegal. I think, while deprecating the behaviour, we should look for the solution in terms of the tax system itself. And a simple, transparent tax system uh, reduces the opportunity uh, for aggressive tax avoidance. You'll find on page 121 of Scotland Future, your guide to an independent Scotland, the actions that the Scottish Government and independent Parliament uh, would seek to take. But can I also draw Patrick Harvey's attention to what we are already doing in this Parliament with the new tax powers that have been introduced, because we have chosen not to ask HMRC to administer them, but instead to go and set up Revenue Scotland. And Michael Clancy, the Director of Law Reform from the Law Society, was giving evidence to the Ken Economy, Energy and Tourism Committee on the 19th of March this year. And what he said was, quote, in the evidence that we are giving the Revenue Scotland and Tax Power Bill, we are looking at the provisions of the Scottish General Anti-Avoidance Rule. We have compared those provisions with the current General Anti-Abuse provisions in the Finance Act 2013, and we think that the Scottish provisions are much better. They are less complex and should prove to be more effective. So I think we have reason for hope and demonstration that what we are introducing with the new responsibilities that we're getting will provide a template for a tax system in an independent Scotland which will secure and protect us against the sort of unacceptable, aggressive tax avoidance, which is widespread in the UK tax system. Question four, Kenneth Gibson. To ask the First Minister what the impact on Scotland will be of UK government plans to raise the retirement age. First Minister. Well, an analysis published this week shows that a 65-year-old could expect the lifetime value of their state pension to be around 11,000 for women and 10,000 for men, less in Scotland than the average for the UK as a whole. And what's more, the UK has based its plans to increase the state pension age on increasing life expectancy. But the reality is that Scottish life expectancy is currently the lowest of all of the UK countries. So this looks to us like a policy which is made in London without consideration for fairness in Scotland. Kenneth Gibson. I thank the First Minister for that response. He will have welcomed UK Pensions Minister Steve Webb MP's admission that state pensions will be secure regardless of the outcome of this September's referendum, contrary to propaganda from the No campaign. Does the First Minister agree that not only will pensions be guaranteed at falling independence, but that but given that Labour's Shadow Secretary of State for Work and Pensions, Rachel Reeves MP, announced that Labour would support Tory Lib Dem UK government pension reforms, the only way to develop a pension regime appropriate to Scotland's particular circumstances is to vote yes in this September's referendum. First Minister. Yeah, yes, I, I do agree with that. And I think when Kenneth Gibson draws attention uh, to the statement of Stephen Webb before the Westminster Committee, uh, then he draws importance to uh, an attachment to a very important point, uh, and that is the No campaign have spent a good amount of time trying to tell people in Scotland that their pensions wouldn't be safe in an independent Scotland. And now the UK Pension Secretary, Steve Webb MP, has admitted in front of a Westminster committee that that is not the case. So I think we're entitled to say, when are they better together, the Labour Tory, Tory Labour, leaflets alleging something which is clearly not true 
going to be withdrawn, and will the Liberal Democrats, because Steve Webb is a Liberal Democrat Member of Parliament, insist that they are better together colleagues stop trying to peddle myths and scaremongering to the people of Scotland? Jackie Bailey. Um, First Minister, not myths, not scaremongering. Independent experts tell us that pensions and pension-related benefits are £100 higher per head of the population in Scotland than they are in the rest of the UK. A good example of pooling and sharing our resources. Indeed, John Swinney even set up a working group because of his concerns about the affordability of pensions in an independent yeah, yeah. Scotland. But at the start of the week, we had the Deputy First Minister Can telling us that pensions Ms. were Billy? affordable. Because we die younger, what an appalling lack of ambition. Surely the First Minister should be coming to this chamber telling us how to improve the health and well-being of pensioners now rather than basing their pensions policy on people dying earlier. First Minister. Yeah. Uh, that's what we've been doing by freezing the council tax for pensioners, by protecting the bus pass for pensioners. All of things which would be at risk if Jackie Bailey and Joanne Order. Lamont had their way. Order. What Steve Webb said to the Westminster Committee, that state pensions would be secure, I'm quoting exactly, secure in an independent Scotland. Now, how can we reconcile that comment made in Parliament with the sort of material that Jackie Bailey comes yes. up with day and daily? And merely chuntering away, Miss Bailey, will not alter the fact that your <laughs> scaremongering has been confounded by your own side. Question number five, Elaine Murray. Thank you, Presiding Officer, to ask the First Minister whether the Scottish Government plans to introduce a lower threshold than £150,000 for claims heard in the Sheriff Courts following the recommendation in the Justice Committee's report of the Courts Reform Scotland Bill. First Minister. Well, in 2007, the previous administration appointed Lord Gill to undertake a wide range of review of the civil court system in Scotland. In 2009, the Scottish Civil Courts Review published the report and recommendations, which include raising the exclusive competence of the Sheriff Court to 150,000. Uh, Lord Gill, appointed by the previous administration, continued to strongly support this limit in his recent appearance at the Justice Committee. Now, we consider that 150,000 is the appropriate limit. Uh, we are, of course, aware that while almost, almost all stakeholders agree that the current 5,000 limit is too low, there are a range of views on what the new increased limit should be. And we are happy to consider these views and, of course, the views expressed in the Justice Committee's report. Lee Murray. I thank the uh, First Minister for that reply. Does the First Minister accept that the proposed threshold for the exclusive com competence of the Sheriff Court is over five times the average full-time annual wage, yeah. and that for an employee who loses income through an injury at work, for example, a settlement of ten or £20,000 can make the difference between penury and maintaining their standard of living? So will the government also support amendments to the Courts Reform Bill to ensure that people on low and average incomes are not disadvantaged by their case no longer being taken in the Court of Session and the loss of their automatic right to representation by an advocate? Mm -hmm. First Minister. I, I, I'm not certain that the member fully appreciates the aim that Lord Gill uh, and in, an, in putting forward this reform is to make justice more accessible to more people to lower the cost of getting justice and not to disadvantage people. Uh, I think the member seems to be taking it from the opposite point of view. And given that she quoted the committee, can I just point out to her that the committee's paragraph 8 says, the committee supports the proposal to increase the limit of the uh, privative jurisdiction, exclusive competence of the Sheriff Court in order, this is the committee report I'm quoting now, in order to free up the court of session to deal with the most complex and serious cases and to ensure that the civil court system works more efficiently and economically. The committee acknowledges the purpose of the reform. As I've said, we are now considering what the committee has said in terms of suggesting that the limit from 5,000 to 150,000 may be, as they said, too big a leap. We are looking at what other people have recommended. We will take that into account uh, in terms of coming to a final conclusion on the proposal. But can she just accept that Lord Gill's purpose in doing this is to make not just the administration of justice in Scotland more efficient, is to make it more accessible to ordinary people to cut down the prohibitive costs of the court of session and make justice accessible to more people in the Sheriff Courts around Scotland. Question 6, Gavin Brown. Officer, to ask the First Minister who took the decision not to proceed 
with the Scottish Business Development Bank and when? First Minister. The banking strategy published on 10 May 2013 set out the plans to examine the creation of a Scottish Business Development Bank to provide additional borrowing to small and medium-sized businesses. The Finance Secretary John Swinney gave it careful consideration, and what emerged from that analysis is that without the powers of independence, yeah. the bank's borrowing would not be additional to the Scottish Government's borrowing limit. In other words, if borrowing was extended to companies, it would have to come off capital investment in Scotland. He therefore decided on the 17th of March it would not be feasible to proceed until we have exactly these powers. Now, I know that Gavin Brown is a, a reasonable man. <laughs> and he will recognise that to get the additionality we were looking for from the business bank proposal, we need exactly the powers that he has stated. So I know he'll join with... Uh, his colleague Murdo Fraser, in recognising that these sort of powers are essential if we're going to take yeah, yeah. some of the exciting initiatives we want to take in an independent Scotland. Yeah. <laughs> Gavin the, Brown. Uh, the First Minister said er earlier that he is in on everything that happens. Mm -hmm. So he should know that his document says, and I quote, this strategy should apply to Scotland's approach to banking regardless of Scotland's constitutional future. <laughs> It also said the money was going to come through accessing new opportunities through European funding streams. It was a good idea, presiding officer. Will he look at it again today and consider yeah, yeah. reopening the case as published in his document? Yeah, yeah. First Minister. Quoting from the entire banking strategy of which this was one proposal, and in detail this proposal in terms of getting additional borrowing would mean that that borrowing would have to be deducted from other purposes. I know that Gavin Brown doesn't want to address this point because it comes exactly to the financial straitjacket that his government and unionist politicians have been satisfied with the people of, of Scotland. But, but can I point to you, in terms of accessing European funding, uh, he may remember that uh, in 2009 I, I launched the Scottish uh, Investment Bank and, and uh, it would be fair to say that some, not I don't think Gavin Brown himself, but there were some colleagues in the Parliament at that time who were less than enthusiastic uh, about the potential success that that bank uh, might have. Can I now tell him that during 2012-13 the Scottish Investment Bank Equity and Debt Scheme invested £32.4 million in 106 companies which leveraged from the private sector 60.4 million from private sector partners. The Scottish Investment Bank now has a portfolio of some 237 investee companies employing some 4,000 people. And because the Conservative Party don't seem to acknowledge that this might be important, given uh, Ruth Davidson's call to Tories to not say anything Order. unless they knew what they were talking about, which I think is very <laughs> pertinent. Can we just think that the companies who have benefited include Touchbonics in Livingston, Spark Energy in the Borders, All Things in Dundee, and many companies across Scotland, all of whom think the work of the Scottish Investment Bank is important, and many of whom think that with the additional borrowing powers of an independent Scotland, then we can bring about even more in terms of business development across the country. Thank you. That ends First Minister's questions. Point of order, Ken McIntosh. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Standing, officer, standing orders clearly state that the purpose of the Public Audit Committee is to consider and report on any document laid before the Parliament or referred to it by the Parliamentary Bureau or by the Auditor General for Scotland concerning financial control, accounting and auditing in relation to public expenditure. Furthermore, the guidance for committees states, and I quote, it is quite common for committee reports to achieve a high level of consensus between members and for findings and recommendations to be agreed without the need for divisions. This has the advantage of adding weight to the conclusions and the likelihood of their being accepted more widely. Presenting officer, this Parliament has, for more than a decade, proudly pointed to the work of its committees as an example of how we do things differently here in the Scottish Parliament. They have been a place for rigorous debate for all that time, but never until the current session have they been a place for sheer government obsequiousness. Order, Mr Gibson. We have a point of, of order. Keep quiet. Mr. Thank Gibson. You, Mr. Gibson. 
Mr Gibson, I am not arguing with you over the chamber. I will see you in my office after First Minister's question time. Mr McIntosh, please continue. Thank you, President Officer. All members are expected to show loyalty to their own political party, but each of us has a parliamentary duty and a responsibility to the public to hold the government to account. If in deliberately trying to downplay, obscure or simply whitewash evidence to any of our parliamentary committees, members are in danger of putting interest to the government and their own party first. That does no one any favours. Presenting officer, there is an expectation that all parliamentary committees, but perhaps most of all the Public Audit Committee, will be robust but fair and objective in its deliberations. I would appreciate your guidance on how we can ensure that the hard-won trust won over several successive parliaments is not lost. Could you advise if this is a matter for investigation by the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee? Can I thank the Member for the advance notice of his point of order? Conducting committees and how each committee approaches any given issue is a matter for those committees and for their conveners. Where any member considers that there is a failing in parliamentary procedures, it is open to that member to write to the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee to request an investigation. Members may also write to the conveners group to ask that body to consider the issue. That ends First Minister's questions. A further point of order? Point of order, Presiding Officer. I, I wish to clarify a, a, a remark that has just been made, just so that no misunderstanding and mistaken identity uh, were, has occurs. It was not Mr Gibson who called out uh, during the previous point of order. It was myself, and I will be happy to come and see you uh, to discuss the matter. Uh, I don't, don't want Mr Gibson to be blamed for something that I was responsible for. Mr Maxwell, I thank you as always for your honesty and integrity and I'll see you after First Minister's question time. We now move to First Minister's questions. We now move to members' business. Members who leave in the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.